My beloved wife of 31 years, Terry, let out another moan as the long, hard, thick object moved in and out of her wet vagina. Her passionate cries ceased momentarily as she gasped, holding her breath before shaking uncontrollably and releasing it in sharp hisses. I recognized that sound and body language well. She had reached climax for the third time, while the relentless thrusting of the object continued mechanically. It seemed oblivious to the effect it had on Terry's quivering body. Her orgasms caused her vagina to produce a significant amount of fluid, which lubricated the ride and dripped down onto the previously clean white sheet she had prepared earlier. After recovering, Terry hoarsely whispered, Come on, baby. I want that big one in my backside now. My vagina has had enough. She attempted to turn over to ease access to her well-lubricated anus, but her legs were swiftly lifted up and the firm object was positioned at her back entrance. With slow, deliberate movements, it entered, eliciting more moans from Terry, who lifted her hips in an attempt to speed up the process. The bulbous head pushed forward slowly, pausing briefly to allow her muscles to adjust to the stretching. With the assistance of the lubrication from her vagina, the object entered her anus relatively easily, prompting Terry to hiss, yes. This signaled the resumption of thrusting. This time, Terry was penetrated deeply with each thrust. It was evident from the glistening surface of the object that Terry had prepared for this as well. It must have been accompanied by an enema earlier in the day, along with her other preparations. Terry was always well prepared. Another orgasm followed, characterized by the same cessation of breath and uncontrollable shaking. I had never seen her in such a state of abandon before. As she experienced what seemed like her sixth orgasm, the object moved effortlessly from her stretched anus to her still wet vagina. This drove Terry into a state of euphoria. The alternating thrusts between her vagina and anus left her unable to hold her breath to climax. She was a mess of pleasure, lost in the intensity of the experience. The climax was abruptly interrupted when the object, accompanied by grunts of pleasure, released a large amount of creamy white fluid, distributing it evenly between her anus and vagina. As this happened, Terry's hand reached up to her sweaty, flushed breast, pinching and pulling her nipple roughly to its limit. Terry let out a piercing scream and shook violently on the white king-sized bed, lifting herself in a manner reminiscent of a scene from a horror movie where someone is being electrocuted. Then she passed out. Silence engulfed the room, broken only by a satisfied sigh from the owner of the cock. But it wasn't me. The cock that had so thoroughly overwhelmed my wife didn't belong to me. Unseen, I had just witnessed what my lovely wife did every Tuesday afternoon while I was at work. This was supposed to be her workout time at the local gym, a routine she followed twice a week. Stepping back. As a primary school teacher, my work schedule was predictable. I was at school at set times, with staff meetings on Tuesday afternoons that usually lasted until 6 p.m. This meant I was always home by 7. Terry would often be tired on Tuesday evenings, supposedly due to her gym workouts, so I usually took charge of dinner while she showered and attended to other chores. Tuesday was also her designated washing day, ensuring clean linen on the bed and a washing machine filled with soiled laundry. However, today was different. Our school principal unexpectedly canceled the staff meeting, giving us an early dismissal. With some free time on my hands, I decided to head home and prepare dinner ahead of schedule. I hoped to create a romantic atmosphere, hoping it might rekindle the intimacy and passion between us. As a long-term diabetic, my ability to maintain an erection was compromised. Most of our sexual encounters involved me pleasuring Terry with my fingers or tongue. Her attempts to reciprocate often ended with me taking over due to her discomfort or fatigue. Over the years, I had accepted this reality as the complications of my diabetes worsened. Terry's upbringing instilled a sense of Catholic guilt regarding carnal activities, making her reserved about exploring new sexual experiences. I was the one who introduced her to masturbation and suggested ways to spice up our sex life, only to be met with resistance. Despite these challenges, I believed our marriage was about more than just sex. However, I noticed Terry growing distant, criticizing my lack of sex drive and attempting to assert control over various aspects of our lives. I attributed this to the ups and downs of marriage, hoping it would resolve itself over time. After all, I considered myself a patient man. Today, I arrived home as usual, 
parking in our garage located a distance from the house to avoid disturbing our children's sleep. Their bedtime was precious, offering us much needed quiet time to recharge. As I walked up to our two-story house, I noticed Terry's car in the driveway, a common sight on her workout days when she preferred taking the bus. With thoughts of tidying up in mind, I entered through the back door, mindful of maintaining the peaceful atmosphere in our home. However, my plans shifted when I spotted Terry's handbag still on the kitchen counter. Knowing her attachment to her purse, I realized something was amiss. My attention was drawn to her gym clothes strewn on the floor nearby, including her leotard and towel. Confused but not fully grasping the situation, I heard noises emanating from our bedroom upstairs. Familiar with the sounds of Terry's pleasure, my initial thought was that she might finally be using the vibrator I had bought her years ago. Yet, I quickly dismissed this idea, knowing Terry's conservative views on sex. As I cautiously ascended the carpeted stairs, I nearly stumbled over a pair of men's shoes placed haphazardly on the steps. The sight of unfamiliar men's clothing and Terry's lingerie scattered along with them sent a wave of disbelief and panic through me. It contradicted everything I believed about our marriage, trust, loyalty, and commitment. Overwhelmed by a mixture of confusion and denial, I found myself needing to sit down to collect my thoughts and steady my trembling body. No, I whispered to myself repeatedly, struggling to comprehend the betrayal unfolding before me. My disbelief transformed into an unfamiliar rage, a feeling I rarely experienced. As a teacher accustomed to maintaining composure in a classroom full of children, this surge of anger was foreign to me. Adrenaline coursed through my veins, igniting a fiery fury that clouded my usually calm demeanor. I had never been in a physical altercation before, and these intense emotions unsettled me. Despite this turmoil, a morbid curiosity propelled me to proceed quietly up the stairs and into our shared wardrobe, which connected to both the bedroom and the upstairs bathroom. From there, I could observe the bedroom through a slight opening in the wardrobe door. It felt surreal, like watching a horror movie unfold before my eyes, a grotesque spectacle of raw passion starring the woman I loved as the unwitting protagonist. The vivid scene played out before me, each detail etching itself into my mind with horrifying clarity. I heard the primal sounds of pleasure emanating from our bedroom, but my mind was consumed by a mix of rage and disbelief. I watched as a stranger's hairy body moved rhythmically between Terry's pale, shaved legs, his grunts synchronized with each thrust. Terry's eyes were tightly shut, her expression contorted in concentration or ecstasy. Her hands clung desperately to the stranger's arms, urging him on, while his gaze fixated on her breasts, a sight I had always believed was reserved for me alone. Despite the chaos in my mind, a rational voice urged me to record the scene unfolding before me on my phone. It was an instinctive response, driven by the need for evidence to confront Terry later and confirm the reality of what I was witnessing. Recording the scene provided a bizarre sense of detachment, allowing me to cope with the overwhelming shock and betrayal. As I fumbled to capture the scene on my phone, my hands trembling with disbelief, a sense of calmness washed over me. It was a strange juxtaposition, the surreal nature of the situation juxtaposed with the mundane act of recording it. While Terry and I had watched pornography together in the past, we had always been mindful of the children discovering it and had gradually stopped as they grew older. Now, the thought of our children stumbling upon this scene filled me with dread and anguish. The artificiality and exaggerated performances in most pornography allowed us to disconnect from reality during our viewing sessions, yet it often served as a prelude to intimate moments between Terry and me. Although she would never admit it, the arousal induced by these films was evident in her physical response, her usually dry arousal replaced by a noticeable witness. Our mutual affection transformed the act of sex into a tender expression of love, contrasting with the carnal scenes depicted on screen. However, what I witnessed was starkly different. Holding the phone in my trembling hand, I watched in disbelief as the scene unfolded before me. This was not a scripted encounter between paid actors, but a real-life betrayal unfolding before my eyes. The woman in the video was not just any performer, she was my wife, my partner, the person I trusted above all others. The visceral pain of betrayal gripped me, forcing me to stop recording and retreat to the solitude of the garage, where I succumbed to the overwhelming nausea that consumed me. 
After what felt like an eternity, but was likely only minutes, I found myself wandering aimlessly in a nearby park, seeking solace in the anonymity of my surroundings. Alone with my thoughts and the damning evidence on my phone, I allowed myself to confront the devastation of my shattered marriage. Tears flowed freely as I grappled with the enormity of the betrayal, the weight of my emotions threatening to overwhelm me. As the battery warning on my phone interrupted my despair, I returned home, my spirit shattered and my sense of self adrift. Terry's concern for my well-being was evident as she greeted me at the door, but I couldn't bring myself to confide in her just yet. With a heavy heart and trembling voice, I feigned illness as an excuse to retreat to the sanctuary of our bedroom, desperate to escape the reality of what I had discovered. Terry's practical suggestion about taking a container to bed resonated with a bitter irony, highlighting the contrast between the ordinary task of preserving cleanliness and the profound betrayal staining our once pristine sheets. With a hint of defiance, I insisted on sleeping in the spare room to spare our bedding from further contamination, retreating downstairs to seek solace in solitude. In the days that followed, Terry maintained her usual demeanor while I mechanically navigated through work responsibilities, seeking refuge in the spare room to avoid the tainted atmosphere of our shared bedroom. Despite my internal turmoil, Terry appeared oblivious to my inner turmoil, carrying on with her routine as if nothing had changed. By Monday, I resolved to confront the truth head-on. I fabricated a pretext for absence at work, arranging for a substitute teacher to cover my class, and embarked on a covert surveillance mission the following morning. Parking discreetly a few blocks away from our home, I stealthily made my way back to our residence, donning inconspicuous attire and soft-soled shoes to evade detection. Crouched amidst the foliage of our garden, I observed Terry's obliviousness to my presence as she carried out her morning routine, her demeanor betraying no hint of guilt or deceit. Her serene composure shattered my fleeting hopes that her previous actions were merely a momentary lapse. As the clock ticked closer to noon, my heart sank as an unfamiliar figure approached our doorstep. With trembling hands, I captured footage of his arrival, his identity momentarily obscured by shadows and foliage. The chilling words exchanged between them left me reeling with a sickening realization of the depth of betrayal. Hey there, my workout partner. Are you ready to sweat it out again? He greeted Terry with a playful tone. Absolutely, Terry responded, her voice laced with anticipation. I'm geared up in my leotard as usual. You always seem to have a thing for these. I sometimes wonder if they were what caught your eye in the first place. Or maybe it was these, she teased, lifting her breasts and giving them a playful squeeze. Darling, you always know how to get me going. Let me show those beautiful breasts some love, he exclaimed, taking Terry's hands and guiding them over her own chest. With skillful precision, he caressed and teased her nipples through the fabric, eliciting soft moans from Terry. As he continued to lavish attention on her, her arousal became evident not only by the dampness around her nipples, but also by the growing wetness between her legs. As he exposed her breasts, he continued his ministrations, alternating between licking, sucking, and gently biting her sensitive nipples. Terry's responsiveness was palpable, a stark contrast to the intimacy we once shared. Despite her sensitivity, she had redirected my focus away from her breasts in recent encounters. Now, witnessing her arousal at another's touch only fueled my distress. Driven by desire, Terry guided him towards the kitchen island, a place usually reserved for meal preparation. My inner voice protested silently, but I was powerless to intervene. With eager hands, she freed him from his clothing, revealing his impressively sized direction. Though not unusually large, it appeared monumental compared to my own modest endowment. Terry's willingness to engage in such acts without reservation added to my sense of inadequacy and betrayal. Watching her eagerly take him into her mouth, I couldn't help but feel a pang of jealousy and resentment. Her actions, once reserved for moments of intimacy between us, were now shared freely with another. The sight and sounds of their passionate exchange echoed in my mind, a painful reminder of the intimacy we had lost. Encouraged by his response, Terry initiated a rhythmic motion, slowly withdrawing and reinserting his cock while simultaneously swirling her tongue around its head and delicately exploring its sensitive underside. His clothing soon bore the evidence of her efforts, soaked with the saliva that cascaded from her mouth onto his trousers and undergarments. Meanwhile, her hands were equally engaged, one fondling his testicles and possibly venturing further, while the other teased his nipples through his shirt. 
The man's pleasure was evident as he matched Terry's movements, rising to meet her downward thrusts with increasing fervor. As his tempo intensified, Terry struggled to keep pace, her efforts focused on maintaining suction as he approached climax. With a final surge, he ejaculated into her mouth, each grunt signaling a fresh surge of semen that she dutifully retained, swallowing every drop with practiced ease. Savoring the moment, Terry gazed into his eyes before indulging in a theatrical display of swallowing his ejaculate, relishing the taste as she playfully licked her lips. Their exchange hinted at further encounters, much to my disbelief. Now it was Terry's turn to reciprocate as the man shed his clothing, revealing his naked form. Playfully eluding his grasp on each step, she teased him until they reached the top of the stairs. There, she reclined, her legs parted invitingly as he eagerly explored her inner thighs with his tongue, eliciting moans of pleasure from Terry. His deliberate teasing only heightened her arousal, her futile attempts to guide him to her clitoris met with playful resistance. When he finally focused his attention on her swollen button, Terry succumbed to ecstasy, her body trembling as he expertly brought her to climax. His mastery of oral stimulation left her in a state of blissful abandon, a stark reminder of the intimacy we once shared. The abrupt halt in breathing, the trembling of the entire body, the whispered exhales, and the loud moans of ecstasy all unfolded before my eyes in vivid detail, like a recurring nightmare. It was becoming all too familiar. Now I understood why I witnessed what I did last week. There was no need for further confirmation. This was clearly an ongoing affair, not merely a one-time occurrence. Their sexual encounters seemed rehearsed, almost choreographed. I had seen enough. Retracing my steps to the garage, I took a moment to collect myself. My heart was still racing, torn between the need to calm down and the urgency to uncover more details. Who, where, why these questions echoed in my mind. The wind was already apparent. But how would I confront Terry about her infidelity? The thought of revealing my knowledge to her felt more agonizing than the betrayal itself. While she may have had time to rationalize her actions, I was thrust into this world of deceit without warning. It dawned on me that I could never love Terry again. The betrayal cut too deep. While some may argue that such wounds can heal with therapy and mutual effort, it was clear that Terry's commitment to our marriage was lacking. The thought of intimacy with her now seemed tainted. I hadn't seen any signs of protection, raising concerns about potential health risks from unprotected encounters. But the question that plagued me most was why? Why was she doing this? Our sex life had always been constrained by Terry's Catholic upbringing, where pleasure was deemed sinful and reserved solely for procreation. Despite my efforts to introduce variety and excitement into our intimate moments, they were met with resistance and disapproval. It took years for her to even attempt certain acts, and her discomfort was palpable, causing me to abandon any further attempts to explore new avenues of pleasure. I couldn't bring myself to pressure her into acts she found repugnant or uncomfortable, even if it meant sacrificing my own desires for the sake of her comfort. I accepted her boundaries, no matter how stifling they felt, out of respect for her autonomy and well-being. But now, faced with the reality of her infidelity, I grappled with a mix of emotions, betrayal, disbelief, and a profound sense of loss. Whether it's perceived as unmanly or not, I couldn't bring myself to engage in activities that didn't feel consensual or mutual. It's not conducive to my libido to have a partner who isn't fully invested in the experience. While some may enjoy control dynamics in their relationships, it's not my preference. So, why did Terry suddenly express interest in things she previously opposed throughout our marriage? And why didn't she communicate these desires with me beforehand? I realized that the infidelity was just a symptom of deeper issues surrounding trust and intimacy in our relationship. Our marriage was crumbling, betrayed at its core. I couldn't help but feel responsible for neglecting to address our sexual dynamics and maybe I should have pushed harder for open communication about desires. Perhaps she felt unable to discuss these matters with me. I needed to reflect on these questions further. I traced back to when it all started. Terry had been attending her gym sessions for about two years, a commitment I fully supported due to its health benefits. The gym provided her with a sense of community, especially with the other women in our neighborhood, whom she connected with through charity work. Maybe the gym was where I could begin unraveling this mystery. As a teacher, I had access to resources, so I printed out profile pictures from my phone footage to begin my investigation. 
I decided to focus on identifying the individuals involved first, hoping it would shed light on the when and where of this situation. My opportunity arose when Terry had her usual gym session on Thursday, and I suggested joining her to assess whether I should also enroll. Despite her initial resistance, I persisted and accompanied her on the next Thursday. Walking into the gym, I sensed curiosity and whispers from the other women, which Terry dismissed as their unfamiliarity with her having company. The session proceeded with the usual routines, but I had to pause midway due to low blood sugar. Terry understood and allowed me to take a break to stabilize my condition. After replenishing my blood sugar with jelly beans, I settled into a side chair and observed Terry, noticing her obvious nervousness. Her frequent glances towards the staff area caught my attention. Taking a closer look around the gym, it resembled any typical fitness center with exercise stations scattered throughout, each equipped with wall mirrors for self-assessment. As a distraction, I wandered towards a wall displaying staff information near the hall exit. My eyes landed on the top photo of Ms. Elizabeth Wiles, the director and owner, followed by her contact details and the photos of three other staff members. Among them was a man I recognized instantly, Mr. Philip Bonte, the man involved with Terry. He was described as the head of exercise regime planning and personal body training. With this revelation, I had identified the person involved. Taking note of his phone number, I glanced back at Terry, who had moved from the station I last saw her at. I returned to my seat and scanned each station until I spotted her engaged in an intense conversation with a man near the staff area entrance. Despite being partly hidden from my view, I could sense her urgency as she gestured for him to leave and quickly return to her assigned station, unaware that I had noticed her absence. Seating with anger, an unfamiliar emotion for me, I struggled to maintain composure as Terry approached, concerned about my well-being. Ignoring her question, I asked if she was ready to leave. Before she could respond, Ms. Wiles announced over the PA system that tonight's final session was canceled due to Mr. Bonte falling ill. The disappointment among the women was palpable, but Terry seemed relieved. Hurriedly collecting her belongings, Terry made a swift exit, avoiding further conversation with a lady who commented on Mr. Bonte's absence. With a dismissive see ya, she practically sprinted to the car, leaving me bewildered by her sudden urgency. The ride home was quiet, with Terry appearing relaxed, her head back and eyes closed as she focused on slow breathing. I couldn't help but notice her demeanor, sensing an opportunity to gather more information now that she seemed relieved about something. That was quite an interesting session, dear, I commented. The gym stations seem well designed. You look really trim and fit. Thank you, honey, she replied. Yes, they have a comprehensive program set up there. I enjoy going, and the ladies there are nice too. It's a shame about Mr. Bonte, though, I remarked. You mean Bounty, she corrected quickly. Phil, I mean Philip Bonte. He usually finishes each session with an intense exercise regime that really challenges everyone and leaves them feeling like they've pushed their bodies to the limit. It's disappointing he didn't show up tonight. Internally, I sighed. She was fully invested in the lie. I was well aware of the limits Philip Bonte was pushing. Perhaps he'll be feeling better next Thursday, I said aloud, already contemplating the upcoming rendezvous between my wife and Mr. Bonte. The following week at school, I was on pickup duty, a hectic time where parents wait in a queue to collect their children. Toward the end of the session, a car pulled up, and to my surprise, it was the woman who had tried to speak to Terry at the gym. Hi, she said. Sorry, I completely forgot about pickup time. Is my son, Timothy, here? I assured her I'd find him and located Timothy near his classroom. As we walked, he mentioned his mother's usual tardiness due to her gym instructor, a detail that immediately raised my suspicion. It's good to see your mom prioritizing her health, I remarked casually. Who's her instructor, by the way? I hoped his answer wouldn't confirm my suspicions. Oh, his name is Bounty, or something like that, Timothy answered. He also works at a local gym and often gives private lessons at people's homes. That's what I want to do when I grow up. My mom really enjoys her exercises with him. On Friday nights, she's really relaxed and seems glowing by the time we get home. It's great. We always have takeout because mom rarely has time to cook on Fridays. No way. 
I thought. This Bonty guy is involved with more people than just my wife. I accompanied Timothy back to his car, where his mom expressed gratitude for our help. No problem, I said. Just part of the job. By the way, I don't think we've met. I'm Gerard Downs. Kids call me Mr. D for short. Nice to meet you. We shook hands, and she replied, Hi, I'm Mrs. Oops, now it's Miss Jones. Mary Jones. I remember seeing you at the gym last Thursday. I was there with my wife, Terry. Sorry, she seemed a bit rushed when we left. Mr. Bonte's absence seemed to throw everyone off that night. At this, her demeanor changed drastically. Previously just a late parent picking up her child, she now became pale and guarded. She was almost shaking. Um, yes, okay. I'll see you around, Mr. Downs. Bye, and drove off. Wow. I thought. What's going on here? Is our jerk Phil involved with someone else too? I admire his stamina, but that doesn't change the fact that he's an absolute jerk. I'm not one to judge others' sexual behavior. What happens between consenting adults is their business. But when one is married, there's a line that shouldn't be crossed. If a married person wants to have sex with someone else, they should discuss separation or an open marriage with their spouse. Not doing so is low. The lowest of the low. And for a single person to knowingly engage with a married person, well, that's just not right in my book. It was time to plan my future, something I thought Terry and I had done together. But now, it looked bleak. It only featured me, without Terry for sure, and maybe without anyone. My anger led me down a path I never thought I'd explore, the path of revenge. I started gathering important details that are often hidden in everyday life. Who pays the bills? What insurance do we have? When are utility bills due? Which account pays for what bills and when? My database of this information began to grow. I found out we had only a small amount left on our mortgage, and my superannuation account had accumulated a staggering $900,000. Thank goodness for our teacher's union, which made compulsory super contributions part of a teacher's basic employment conditions. After researching the topic extensively online without Terry's knowledge, I realized that there was no avoiding the fact that our assets would need to be divided evenly. With our children now independent, we had a significant amount saved in a cash account earmarked for an overseas trip, around $30,000. However, that trip was off the table. My first step was to deplete that account as quickly as possible before Terry caught wind of my discovery. I began sabotaging various appliances in our house, making them malfunction when Terry wasn't around. I claimed that a repairman had come, charged us a certain amount, and fixed the issue for a slight discount if paid in cash. I'd then stash away the cash and pretend to fix the appliance myself. Through this method, I managed to hide away about $20,000. Additionally, I would buy tools with cash, show them to Terry, then return them the next day for a refund in cash. It was deceitful and underhanded, but trust and honesty had already eroded from our relationship due to Terry's actions. It was turning me into someone I never thought I could be, a liar. Terry's workouts with Bonte continued on Thursday afternoons, but our intimate relationship had long since dwindled. We coexisted like roommates, and my personal belongings gradually disappeared into boxes in the garage. Terry rarely ventured into the garage, so she didn't notice the rearrangement. I withdrew all the superannuation I could and purchased a small house on the outskirts of town. It was modest, with only two bedrooms and a small yard, but it had a garage and was close to my workplace. The mortgage balance was manageable on my salary alone. This wasn't a luxurious mansion, but it suited my needs perfectly. As I moved my personal items into the new house, I realized how much I had yielded to Terry's preferences in our previous life together. Furniture wasn't a concern. I could find second-hand pieces at charity shops. My life felt like a second-hand one, once loved, now forgotten, and reliant on charity to retain any value. It was time for the individuals involved to face the consequences of their actions. I reviewed the footage I had of Terry and Phil, excluding the audio. The dialogue between them was too painful to hear. At one point, that jerk Phil referred to me as that sucker. 
Terry didn't object, but she did flinch slightly, acknowledging the wrongdoing. Her guilt manifested subtly after each Thursday rendezvous with her lover as she attempted to initiate some form of intimacy with me on Fridays. However, my heart and libido were as cold as ice, and I couldn't comply. Terry seemed to have forgotten how to arouse my interest, and her attempts gradually faded. While she was willing to respond to a horny husband, admitting her own desires and expressing them to me was apparently off-limits. Perhaps some of the blame was mine, but I never sought satisfaction elsewhere. Terry's transformation left me speechless, contemplating the sexual freedom and experimentation that I could have embraced with her instead of being left outside by her betrayal. Around this time, I reconnected with Mary Jones, this time initiated by her. It happened during the school pickup. She was the last parent to arrive, leaving me alone with Timothy, her son. When she approached, I noticed her nervousness and signs of recent tears. As teachers, we often pick up on these cues, offering insights into students' lives and helping us understand how to support them academically. Mr. D, can I talk to you for a minute? She nervously asked. Of course. No one else is coming, so stay parked there and join me in my office, I replied, referring to the benches around the school. She parked her car, Timothy played with his soccer ball, and we sat on the bench near the pickup area. I don't know how to begin what I want to tell you, she started. I'm not sure how much you know about the gym you saw me in. I looked directly at her. I know Terry, my wife, enjoys going there, and it has been beneficial for her fitness and activity levels, I cautiously responded. There are things you need to know about what happens there, she continued, struggling to speak through tears. Does it involve Philip Bonte? I asked, attempting to steer the conversation to the point. You have no idea how much it has to do with that pig, she exclaimed passionately. I think I may have an idea, but please, tell me what you wanted to share, I encouraged. Well, she continued with more confidence, he's a player. His sole purpose for being there is to sleep with as many of the regular women as possible. How do you know this? I inquired. Because I was one of them, she confessed tearfully. I'm telling you this because I've come to realize who, and more importantly, what he is. Up until a week ago, we had a regular sexual relationship. He would come to my place every Friday around 12.30, and we would engage in passionate activities. He was skilled, knew exactly how to please me. She paused, gazing wistfully at the sky as if reminiscing about their encounters. Meanwhile, I recalled his sessions with a different sentiment. I enjoyed what he did to me until he replaced me without a second thought. I thought we had a future. I've been divorced and missed the intimacy of a committed relationship, and I thought we could have that. How wrong I was. I was taken aback by her openness. Marriage relationships aren't always what they seem, I responded a bit hastily, unable to conceal my pain. You already know, don't you? She asked slowly, seeing the anguish in my expression. You know he's been involved with Terry, your wife. Yes, I knew, Mary. Thank you for sharing this, I replied, struggling to keep the bitterness out of my tone. But I've already set something in motion regarding the situation. I believe in karma, and I think it'll catch up with him soon. That bastard has to pay. Mary exclaimed. He doesn't care who he hurts as long as he satisfies his ego. If you need help getting back at him, let me know. That bastard deserves to pay dearly, she emphasized. She called her son over and left, leaving me lost in thought. I felt a strange sense of relief after Mary's confession. Initially, my revenge plan seemed like a petty response to my failed marriage. But now, I realized it required more consideration. I wondered how many other women he had entangled from the gym. It was time to gather information. Despite my disdain for him, I couldn't help but acknowledge his audacity. Even the devil himself never seems to tire. I discovered that he worked at the gym every day except Mondays when it was closed. Recalling the phone number from the gym wall, I traced it back to an address just three blocks away from ours. No wonder that jerk could conveniently walk to our place to engage in extramarital affairs with my soon-to-be ex-wife. I informed Terry that I would be taking daily walks around 5 p.m., claiming it was at the insistence of my diabetes specialist. 
Fortunately, she didn't object or try to join, knowing it wouldn't interfere with her rendezvous. On the first evening walk, I headed straight to Bonte's address and observed that he lived in a ground-floor apartment within a block of similar units. Since his car wasn't there, I waited nearby to catch his arrival. Like clockwork, he returned just before six, repeating this routine on days I could walk, except for my staff meeting days. It seemed he followed this pattern whenever the gym was open. Did he have a different partner each day? I was astounded by his consistency. This man must have an incredible stamina. I'm used, realizing God wasn't an appropriate term, given his actions. Demon seemed more fitting. Determined to uncover if he was involved with other women, I adjusted my walks to observe his movements earlier each day. I decided to take a week off school for this purpose, easily obtaining a sick certificate from my doctor due to my diabetes. Equipped with the necessary surveillance tools purchased from an electronic store, including discrete long-range listening devices, motion-activated HD cameras, and an extra-portable hard drive for storage, I planned my strategy. On Monday, I discreetly installed one of the cameras in Bonte's apartment, which wasn't overly spacious, making it easy to cover most areas with a single device. Accessing his apartment was simple. I waited for him to leave for the gym and retrieved his keys from under the doormat, a predictable hiding spot. After confirming the camera's functionality, I left, knowing that any movement or sound in his apartment would trigger the camera to stream live video and audio to my computer, where it would be stored with timestamps. The surveillance began immediately upon Bonte's return home on Monday night, capturing clear footage of his activities, including dining and retiring to bed around 9 p.m. On Tuesday, I waited until the gym closed and entered through the neglected back door. This was where I placed the next camera in the private room often used by Bonte for personal health assessments. Reflecting on my actions, I questioned the kind of person I had become. Spying on others with cameras felt intrusive, and I worried about where this would lead. Wednesday, while Terry was out grocery shopping, I discreetly installed the third and fourth cameras in our bedroom and living area. Reviewing the footage from Tuesday, I wasn't surprised by what I saw and heard, given the circumstances. Bonte woke up and left immediately, returning later with breakfast. Lazy bastard can't even make breakfast for himself. I thought, before acknowledging his sexual prowess. He seemed like a sexual machine, physically fit and capable. He left for the gym at 10.30 after making an intriguing phone call. Thursday, I set up my computer in the garage, eagerly awaiting the unfolding events. Bonte's camera streamed to my screen as he woke up and called Terry's phone. I could hear their conversation clearly. Hey, it's Phil. How's my favorite slut feeling today? More importantly, how's your pussy? Terry responded flirtatiously, unaware of the camera's presence. Their exchange was both shocking and revealing. As they discussed their plans for the day, including their usual rendezvous at 1230, I couldn't help but wonder about the nature of their relationship and what surprises Phil had in store for Terry. At 10.30, Bonte left for the gym, and shortly after, the camera in his private room activated. He was seen sitting at his desk with an attractive lady, whom he addressed as Mrs. White or Joan. He inquired about her desire for a more personalized exercise session, acknowledging her improved fitness level. Joan coyly explained that her increased vitality was generating excess hormones, implying a need for something more. Bonte, with a hint of lust in his voice, instructed Joan to stand and proceeded to guide her through physical exercises, his hands exploring her body with calculated precision. His touch evoked a palpable tension, and Joan's reactions hinted at an intense arousal. Aware of his reputation among the gym's clientele, Joan had anticipated this encounter, but the reality surpassed her expectations. After teasing her senses, Bonte abruptly ceased and suggested scheduling a private session outside the gym due to its limitations. Joan agreed, mentioning her husband's absence and their privacy. She emphasized the need for discretion, and they settled on a time for their next rendezvous. As Joan left, her excitement was evident, with subtle physical indicators of her arousal. Mary, the parent from the school, was eager to assist, so I tasked her with compiling a list of women that individual had been involved with. Within a week, she had gathered names and addresses of 30 women, all connected to the gym, including Terry. This revelation filled me with shame and anger. 
I had nearly completed my withdrawal from our house, which had lost its emotional significance and was now just a structure. Terry remarked once about its emptiness, to which I explained my efforts to declutter. The garage items had been moved to my new house, and I was only a short gathering away from completely leaving. Divorce papers were prepared, finances settled, and our holiday fund drained into my account with receipts for fake purchases ready. My superannuation beneficiaries were changed, and I had my own accounts, credit cards, and insurance policies. Terry's car was transferred to her name only, and a new mobile phone was obtained under my name. I prepared packages for each woman's partner, detailing the affairs and including information about a sexual health clinic. An anonymous review was left on the gym's website, warning about predators, and a letter was sent to the owner regarding the head instructor's conduct. On the kitchen table, I left divorce papers, printed photos from surveillance footage, DVDs of their encounters, and my wedding ring, split in half and covered in excrement, with a note addressed to Terry, disassociating myself and warning against contact except through the lawyer. I also informed our children and took steps to prevent her from entering the school grounds. Epilogue. After settling into my new house, I braced myself for the fallout, and it arrived with force. The scandal at the local gym made headlines in the newspapers, leading to its closure and the owner's departure. The ex-instructor was brutally attacked in a downtown alley, allegedly by a group of unidentified men. Divorce filings flooded the local court, and many homes hit the market. Terry returned home to find my parting gifts and promptly fainted. A neighbor witnessed the scene, quickly grasping the situation. She called for emergency assistance before leaving, not forgetting to express her disdain for Terry's actions. Despite Terry's attempts to reach me, she was unsuccessful, leading to her arrest when she tried to visit the school. A night in custody and a stern warning from the magistrate deterred further attempts. Our children, both married themselves, condemned Terry's behavior unequivocally. They inherited a strong sense of fidelity from me, contrasting sharply with Terry's actions. The divorce proceedings concluded, forcing Terry to sell the house and relocate to a smaller home in the outskirts, where she faced public ridicule and rejection. Meanwhile, I resumed teaching and settled into my new residence, but the emptiness lingered. Despite seeking revenge, the loneliness and sadness of betrayal overshadowed any sense of victory. In the end, there were no winners, only the lingering ache of lost love and broken trust. Write your opinion in the comments. Thanks for watching and have a great day.